All right, we are going to talk about insider trading today. I am joined by Dan Taylor, who is professor of accounting at the University of Pennsylvania's Horton School of Business and director of the Horton Forensic Analytics Lab and an expert on insider trading. Dan, thank you for joining us today. Thanks for having me, James. My pleasure. So, Dan, let's just start from the basics. If I'm a regular person, when I think about insider trading, I probably think about, I don't know, like the Martha Stewart case or the movie Wall Street, where this, you know, Gordon Gecko is this fictitious, evil, like, you know, trading trader who, who gets uh, inside tips and then cheats to get ahead. And that's, that's certainly one facet of insider trading. But, but rather than, let's say, Wall Street being the headline movie title, uh, as I got into this, I'm realizing that, that Fifty Shades of Grey might be a more applicable title in, in that there, you know, th there's a lot of, of absence of black and white, I guess you could say, especially with regard to corporate insiders who are, you know, inside, uh, insiders by definition. Would you say that that summary is accurate? Yeah, it's, I think that's a pretty accurate summary. And generally speaking, broadly, I should say there's two theories of insider trading. One theory of insider trading is the misappropriation theory. So uh, misappropriation theory uh, could be, you know, the Gordon Gecko types could be someone who's outside the firm uh, or inside the firms and they steal information that isn't theirs, misappropriate it and use it for their own private benefit. So a famous example of misappropriation theory of insider trading is that there were some analysts, and this is a public case, there were some analysts at Capital One who were seeing retail sales flow through the capital, various Capital One credit cards. And so they were seeing retail sales for like Abercrombie & Fitch, American Eagle, JC Penney's, Macy's, all of these retails flow through the credit cards. And based on that retail flow of purchases at those retail outlets, they traded in advance of earnings news, trying to use that retail credit card data to predict um, you know, whether the firm would beat earnings expectations or not. They weren't authorized to do that. It wasn't their data. So that was misappropriation. They misappropriated data that didn't belong to them and used it for, for their own gain. The second theory of insider trading is what's known as the classical theory of insider trading. And that's what we typically think of as applying to um, officers and directors of publicly traded companies who have a fiduciary duty to shareholders. So in the classical case, it's typically an officer or director who violates their fiduciary duty or their duty of care or duty of loyalty uh, and it, at, you know, at shareholders' expense to enrich themselves. So, for example, if the CFO learns that they're going to miss their earnings target for the year and trades shortly before that, you know, those poor results are announced, that would be um, violating his fiduciary duty to shareholders, basically using information that he obtained in the course of his uh, employ for his own you know, personal benefit at the expense of shareholders. So with respect to corporate insiders, that fiduciary duty gives rise to something that's known as disclosure or abstain. So in the U.S., corporate officers and directors either have to disclose any material non-public information that they are aware of, or they have to abstain from trading. So it's okay that you learn that the company is doing poorly. You can put out a press release lowering your earnings targets, and then you can trade, right? So that would be disclose and then trade. If you don't put out that press release lowering your earnings targets, then you cannot trade. So that would be disclose the earnings targets, which you didn't do, so then abstain from trading. So those are the two broad categories of types of insider trading that are recognized under current U.S. Uh, in the current U.S. legal system. Sure. And, and that's certainly helpful. And, and it would seem that that even within that, Dan, there's some gray area. I mean, if I'm a, a CEO or a, a CFO, that is a, oh, I thought that was a big bottle of orange juice. That's just the color of your your, your canteen, it looks like. There's quite a lot of sugar in the morning, I was thinking, um, so <laughs> or some orange soda. So anyway, if I'm, if I'm a CFO, CEO, whatever, uh, obviously, if I know my company is going to be acquired uh, next week and, and I I trade in advance of that. That's a no-no. But you know, if I'm you know maybe thinking kind of sort of that there's a chance I, I may be able to sell the company in the coming quarters. Um, I mean, it's it's not off the radar, but it's not definite, right? I mean, wouldn't that be a little bit more gray area, right? Absolutely, and that I think is where we see most of the actual trade occurs is inside that gray area. 
because one of the, for better or worse, one of the things that the U.S. court system has demanded of um, the SEC and the DOJ when they bring these cases is that they be able to pin the trading to a piece of hard information, not soft information, but hard information. So an example that I give in one of my papers, we did some research on insider trading around in the U.S., the uh, the, ba- the bailouts of banks in the 2008 financial crisis, it was the Troubled Asset Relief Program, or TARP. And we looked at the trading of officers and directors in banks that had connections with Treasury or the Federal Reserve. And the theory there is that through their connections at Treasury or Federal Reserve, you know, they might call upon their, their friends to figure out, like, you know, sort of what's going on or get a broader sense of what's going on in the economy and what the government's plans are, not only in terms of broad rescue package, but in terms of their specific bank. So you can imagine, for example, a phone call where, you know, the, um, someone in the Federal Reserve or the Treasury calls up, you know, a director at the bank and says, hey, Jim, you know, can't tell you anything definite, but, you know, chances are looking good. The government's going to get involved and uh, you're going to be here to, you know, backstop the banks and help you guys out. Click. And the, hangs up the phone. What's the information there? Now, you and I, and I specifically as a statistician, would say that the person on the other end of the phone call revised the probability of government intervention and government help for their bank upward. But a defense lawyer is going to say, well, you know, he didn't say that they were giving them $5 billion, didn't say when they were doing it. There wasn't actually any information that was communicated. So I think one thing that our courts struggle with in the U.S. is understanding soft information as opposed to hard information. So in that case, the ideal would be that numbers were actually exchanged and dates were given, as opposed to just a general sense of what was going to happen that would increase your probability, but wasn't actually hard in the sense of specific numbers. So if I'm a corporate insider in the U.S., and I should just clarify, we're, we're talking about the U.S. law in this case, although some of these principles, uh, just from my own looking around, extend to Japanese markets, uh, EU markets, and, and U.K. markets as well, but we're explicitly talking about the U.S. If I'm a corporate uh, insider, and I'm a pretty good person, you know, maybe I'm not perfect, uh, but I can still be following the letter of the law, but but operating in in, in quite a big sea of gray area. And if I'm smart, I'm probably going to do that. I'm going to avoid doing anything totally stupid, but but I've got a lot of leeway. In fact, I I recall, I'm forgetting the name of the authors, but one paper showed that uh, if you look at insider buys, they, at least according to this one study, uh, uh, Leslie Jung was one of the authors, beat the the market by like 11.8 percentage points per year, which would kind of make corporate insiders some of the best investors in the world. And, you know, I don't I don't know if that's right, uh, fair or not, but that seems to be the reality. Yeah, I mean, the papers, Jeng Metric and Zeckhauser, yeah. and they're they're right that, you know, generally speaking, there's two reasons why an insider, two broad reasons why an insider might sell. The one is because they're selling because they have information and they think the stock price is going down. So they're going to get out now. Right, so we would consider that to be an informed sell. The other reason that you would sell is because you have to pay the Wharton or the Wharton tuition bill, you know, or you want to buy a yacht, or you want to buy a house, or you need to consume, or you want to diversify, right? So if you're an executive at one of these top firms, you're going to get 80 to 90% of your wealth will be concentrated in the firm because you're going to get executive compensation that comes in the form of equity. Right? And maybe you don't want 80% of your wealth tied up in the firm. You want to diversify, invest in the S&P, invest in bonds, these sorts of things. So for sales, there's generally two reasons why you might see it. Diversification slash consumption or informed trade. Diversification slash consumption doesn't apply to purchases. Right. So if you're purchasing something, you are sending a signal that of all of your investment opportunities available to you, you are choosing to invest in the firm, a firm that you might already have 80 percent of your wealth concentrated in. So it's the opposite of diversification. And so when somebody says, you know what, I'm already 80 percent concentrated in this stock, let me buy even more. That's a pretty strong signal that the person has either some sort of intrinsic beliefs about where the stock price is going to go 
And then if they have intrinsic beliefs, the question is, is what are the beliefs based on? Is it based on just public information or is it also based on private information? So that's why purchases tend to be viewed uh, as more informed and as market beating, whereas the average sale, that's simply not you know, not the case. The average sale does not underperform the market, uh, at least in the U.S. Makes sense. And let me take a detour to some to, to a topic that many people may think is ridiculous. But uh, why is insider trading bad? You know, I think uh, there are some, at least, if you look at a study of the Japanese uh, stock market price um, in the late 80s, uh, early 90s, they banned insider trading right around the peak. And the market crashed. I don't think banning insider trading was the main catalyst for that. I think there are probably a lot of other reasons. But there are those, Dan. Uh, Henry Mann was uh, an early thinker in the U.S. in the 1960s who, who wrote uh, at least one book and many, many uh, articles about insider trading. There are those who uh, originally said, maybe it's not so bad. It's just more efficiently uh, incorporating information. Uh, if they're wrong, why? Yeah. So first off, I don't, I don't think that they're wrong in the sense that I do think that our corporate insiders, when they trade, they are, if they're trading on private information, they are impounding information into prices, right? So they are taking private information, their private information, and they're putting into prices by buying a million shares, two million shares, and that'll push prices up a little bit. But let's take that out to the corner solution. So Henry Mann and others uh, have taken that to the, to the corner solution. So I admit that I, I occasionally have libertarian principles inside me. And, you know, there is this libertarian view that, you know, insider trading that's currently illegal should be legal under the auspices of improving price efficiency. So, Taylor, you just admitted it improves price efficiency. So that's a good thing. Let's let it happen. Well, so in the 1960s, and this is the, the, the origin of this line of thought, there was this notion out of Chicago. Henry Mann was in Chicago. Who else was in Chicago? Eugene Fama, the father of modern efficient markets theory, which says that the market impounds all publicly available information. And so if your objective is market efficiency in the 1970s, they said, that's our objective, market efficiency. So let's let insider trading happen. The problem is in the 1970s, they didn't have the market structure or the data to understand market efficiency. Market efficiency was assumed by fiat. It wasn't a question of, well, we observe the market is efficient. How did it become efficient? Instead, it's the market is efficient. Done. And the answer to why they're wrong is in how the market becomes efficient. How the market becomes efficient is in the trading of retail, of institutions, of smart money, of dumb money, of hedge funds, of pension funds, of all of that trading and liquidity. Right. So there's a very old relation between liquidity of the market and the level of market efficiency. If the markets are illiquid, there's no, there's no liquidity, there's very few people trading, it's generally viewed as not being an efficient market because if you want to buy and sell, you have to pay a really steep price, a really high bid-ask spread, or potentially bare liquidity risk or timing risk. Well, if you allow insider trading and you say insider trading is legal in the US, what's going to happen? On the one hand, you would say, ah, oh, market efficiency is going to improve. That was the 1960s, 1970s view. But in 1990s and the 2000s, there's something known as rational expectations and the information impossibility of efficient markets. That was Grossman Stiglitz. And they said, well, wait a minute. People are trading in the market and they're choosing whether to trade. If we allow insider trading, the people who are not informed, who do not have private information are not going to participate, right? And that's kind of what you see when you when the Pew Research Center does a poll and 50% of Americans see the stock market as being rigged. And you have this notion that, oh, well, if there's two sets of laws or if insider trading is legal, we're just going to put our money elsewhere. We'll hide it under the mattress, put it in the bank, buy a savings bond, maybe invest in another country. A great example of this um, can't remember the title of the paper, but the author is um, Bhattacharya, mm -hmm. um, looked at insider trading in Mexico. And I want to say in either in the 80s or the 90s. And wouldn't you know, in Mexico, when there's an earnings announcement, stock prices don't move. Right? So the corporation has got its public 
results publicly disclosed them for the first time. On average, stock prices don't move. In the U.S., on average, they move. They either move up or they move down. But you see trading volume and you see absolute price changes. Don't see that in Mexico back then. Why? Well, his theory was because Mexico didn't have laws against insider trading. So what that meant is, is that there was rampant insider trading and all of the information in those press releases was already impounded into prices. Now, let me ask you, is that the kind of market that you want to trade in? When the company puts out a public release and it's already in prices, too late. It's an efficient market, but is it one that you want to be participating in? Yeah, you, you wouldn't go, or at least I wouldn't go sit down at a, at a poker table if everyone else is wearing you know, hats and sunglasses because that, that tells me they're a whole lot higher level than I am and they know a lot of stuff. I mean, that's just a game, right? And this is even more extreme. So I hear you. If it's not fair, who wants to play it, right? Right. And, and the, the issue is, is that in the U.S., the insider trade law is not built around fairness. It's built around that theft or that violation of the fiduciary duty. But the sense, you know, of why we don't like insider trading has to come down to, you know, comes down to this notion of, uh, of fairness or of equal opportunity. And so what's important to realize here is, is that it's not that you're reading publicly financial, public financial information and then extracting new insights, right? That's not insider trading, right? What's insider trading is, is when you steal information or when you expropriate information that doesn't belong to you for your own benefit. That's when it crosses the, the red and, and speaking of fairness, might that, might one of the reasons for that condition, that situation be, and, and I've heard you in, in, in prior interviews say, there's actually no statute. There's no statutory law in the U.S. restricting insider trading, which, you know, to the average person sounds, I wouldn't say insane, but sounds pretty extreme, pretty shocking, pretty surprising. Um, why? Why? A, I just want to confirm that. And, and B, um, why is that? I mean, it's, it's 2022. This is ostensibly the most advanced or one of the most advanced economies in the world. Um, why, why is that still the case? Well, let me let me put the little little bug in your ear. Is that a feature of the system or is it a bug in the system? Which one of it is it? So now let's let's scroll back a second. That's that's right. There is no law against insider trading. So in the US, insider trading charges typically come under what's known as case law as opposed to code law that's been codified in a formal statute. And so case law is based on former courts or lawyers' interpretations of various statutes. So in the U.S., most insider trading cases are charged under anti-fraud provisions like mail fraud, wire fraud, these sorts of things. Which seems pretty roundabout. Right. It is definitely roundabout. And so that has you know, been brought up since the 70s, 80s, 90s, 2000s. And so that's a real weakness in the U.S. system, in my opinion, and one of the reasons it's a weakness is because anytime there's a, uh, you know, the SEC or the DOJ is faced with an insider trading case, they necessarily have to look back and ask, is this insider trading case consistent with prior precedent? And if it's not, it's really risky to bring because there's no bright line rule that says, yes, this is insider trading or no, this is insider trading. There's only prior cases. And so what gets you with the trouble is when you have a situation that you and I and your listeners and readers may think is that's definitely insider trading, but there's been no precedent. And the reason for that is because the nature of the market is changing. The nature of our market these days is not the same as 1980s. But yet, some of the seminal insider trading cases that are still being cited was from the 1980s and the 1990s. So because we don't have a codified statute against insider trading, it creates these perverse incentives for our regulators to try and fit all of the insider trading cases in under sort of um, prior rules. Let me give a great example of this. And this is a case that is, is currently before, um, before judge. It is the SEC versus Panuat. And so you can read about this, uh, read about this case, P-A-N-U-W-A-T. Um, so this is undecided. Right. And um, it's a great example. I teach this example in class of where the common law system or excuse me, the case law system in the U.S. really runs a rock or really runs um, runs a mess, I should say. So Panawat is working for a company 
and he learns from the CEO that the company is going to be bought. So Panelot works for Company A. Company A is getting, getting bought out at a very high premium, very high premium. And I'm just going to abbreviate some of the facts. You can check the case to, to verify all this. Within minutes, this is a fact, within minutes of learning that information from the CEO, the Company A is going to be bought out at a large premium. He purchases stock and options in Company B. Company B is a peer of Company A. So the logic here is, is that, well, if Company A is getting bought out at a huge premium, and that's not public, once that's announced, our peers in the industry, our small, in this case it was small biotechs, will also get bid up. So I'm not trading in Company A. I'm going to trade in Company B. Now, is that insider trading? I think students of markets and you and I would look at that and we would say, yeah, that's insider trading. He got information from the CEO. He immediately went out and used it. He wouldn't have bought, never bought stock in Company B before or options in Company B before. Clearly, that information is what caused him to make those transactions. But you know what, James? There's never been a case brought previously on, for insider trading when you learn information about Company A and you go out and trade Company B. So I know some people in the white collar defense at very prominent law firms and they disagree about whether this is insider trading or not. So on the one hand, there's some lawyers that say, yes, this is clear misappropriation. He had information that he got from his company. He was not authorized to use it. He signed um, an insider trading policy, signed a non-disclosure, signed confidentiality, and he violated that by trading, enriching himself. But there are others that say, no, 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 no. Insider trading trading on material non-public information. Yes, it was material. Yes, it was non-public. But throughout history in the U.S., it's only been about the stock that you got the information on. And this is the first case that's being brought when it's about a sister or peer stock. Now, what I find shockingly offensive about that worldview is that it implies that if I'm the CEO of Coke and I learn that we're exiting the Diet Cola market, I can go buy some shares in Pepsi. Right? That would be hugely valuable in Pepsi. Or if ExxonMobil CEO suddenly decides, you know what, guys, we're getting out of the oil business, going into solar panels. He can go out and he can buy some crude oil or he can buy some U.S. oil ETF. Because although he has private information about what Exxon's doing, and that information will surely spill over to crude oil prices, it's not literally information about crude oil prices. It's information about his company. So that's in a gray area where prior case law is based on information about stock A and trading in stock A. And this is a new case where it's information about stock A that's used to trade stock B. And we'll see how the courts come down. But I really worry if the court decides that this is not insider trading. And, and I think most people with common sense would, would agree that that's pretty ridiculous. But it's just, I mean, glad it's a case, but it's just, it's sad as you illustrate that if I'm prosecuting something like that, I've got a hill to climb that, that maybe I shouldn't have to climb, ideally. Um, let me shift gears. Speaking of, of outside the U.S. now, you have a recent paper holding for an insider's account, which, whose title I, I like off the bat, with uh, Robert Jackson, who formerly led the SEC, and, and Bradford Lynch, basically uh, saying that the rules are a little, uh, or the, the compliance, the policies are a little easier for foreign CEOs, foreign CEOs whose stocks trade in the U.S., and I think they avoided 11.8 or $11.9 billion in losses, according to your findings, by, by getting out early. Uh, what's, what's the, speaking of things that, that are the way they are, but probably shouldn't be, what's the issue with that? Yeah, so uh, way back when, when they had these rules that were created as part of Sarbanes-Oxley in 2002, they had this requirement that uh, insiders file their transactions in the company stock. So if you're the CEO of company A and you trade in company's A stock, you have to disclose that electronically within two business days on Edgar for the world to see. So in the U.S., we have a form, it's called the Form 4 Reporting Rule, because it's reported on Form 4, within two business days, any transactions in the company's equity publicly reported. Okay? Now, for one reason or another, you know, when they crafted SOX, they exempted foreign private issuers. So foreign private issuers did not have to disclose 
the trades of their officers and directors within two business days or disclose it with electronically. So there are no Form 4 reporting requirements for foreign firms listed in the U.S. So there's two prominent examples of this that we give in the paper. The first is when COVID, you know, swept the world. You might remember if you were paying attention in the U.S., there was a lot of dust up in media coverage of the trades by Pfizer and Moderna CEOs and chief scientists, right? Because they were developing these vaccines. They were telling you how great the vaccines are, but yet the CEOs were selling. And so people were really stressing out. Why are you selling if the vaccine is being developed? Well, there was another company that was developing a vaccine at the time, AstraZeneca. There wasn't any scrutiny in the U.S. of AstraZeneca's trades. AstraZeneca, as you and your listeners may know, not based in the U.S., you know, based in Europe, based in England, UK. They don't have to file their trades in the U.S. So one of the reasons that there wasn't any scrutiny of their trades is because U.S. journalists look at the SEC system and they don't see any trades of AstraZeneca in the U.S. system, despite the fact that AstraZeneca has securities that trade on the U.S. exchanges. Right? So that's the first thing. By virtue of not having to file these Form 4s, our foreign companies listed in the U.S. avoid scrutiny. This took a renewed focus with the wave of Chinese companies that got listed on the New York Stock Exchange and the fact that many of these ex post turned out to be or will turn out to be frauds, luck and coffee being a uh, preeminent example. These companies also were exempt, not only from having their books inspected by the SEC and the Public Company Audit Oversight Board, so China isn't letting U.S. regulators actually look at the underlying books and records underneath the financial statements, but those same companies to whom U.S. regulators can't actually reach don't have to file Form 4s. This is really weird when you think about it from an academic point of view, because China, other foreign companies, Cayman, Russia, they have non-extradition treaties with the, or not, not even a treaty, they have non-extradition status with the U.S. So the Department of Justice and the SEC can't go get someone in China for violating U.S. securities laws. So this has coined the term the law-proof insider. Someone whose company is listed on U.S. exchanges, but yet the company is domiciled in a country that has non-extradition. So as an academic, we would think, well, we need to have really onerous disclosure rules on them. Because if they break the law, there's no chance we're going to be able to, you know, get them or punish them. So when we think about how people factor in their decisions, they weigh the costs and the benefits. One of the costs of insider trading is you go to jail or you get a large fine. But that's not going to be the case for these insiders in non-extradition countries. So that means we need to keep close tabs on them. But rather than have higher disclosure standards for these non-U.S. companies that are listed in the U.S., we have lower disclosure standards. So there's no Form 4 reporting. There is reporting under Form 144. So Form 144 is a paper form that is filed by mail, not electronically. And you gave the name of my paper. It might be hard for your readers to believe that items are still filed with the U.S. regulator by mail. Yes, it's the case. You can read the paper. Got a nice actual screenshot or a little uh, shot of the actual area in the SEC of the file cabinets with all of the forms. So they mail the form to the SEC, the SEC takes the form, sticks them in a file cabinet in the SEC public reference room, which is on the lowest publicly accessible floor of the SEC. How do you get those forms? Well, you have to walk into the SEC, open the file cabinet and look at the forms. And that's what we did. And so we scanned and digitized a lot of these forms. And that gave us insight on some of the trading of these corporate officers and directors in these foreign firms. Now I would say the 144 in our data is only for sales of restricted stock. So that's what triggers a Form 144 reporting requirement. No buys, no stock options, just restricted stock. And based on that data, we were able to compile you know, how much losses they avoid, how profitable their trades are, whether they're front running earnings announcements, and what we found was absolutely mind boggling. So just to give your listeners a, a tour of some of the findings we found, 
we found that both the average and the median, which means the 50th percentile, halfway point in the distribution, Chinese corporate insider, when they trade, on average, they avoid a over 20% loss. So that means that when you see a trade in a U.S. listed Chinese security by a Chinese corporate insider, the price on average is going to fall by 20% over the next six months. We found similar results for the Cayman, and we found similar results for Russian insiders. We found a little bit less, but still statistically significant at, the, at uh, about 10% losses for Indian. And so based on that information, we got, we played a little game of Mr. Taylor, or Dr. Taylor goes to Washington. We did some Senate testimony. My colleague, uh, Rob Jackson, did some Senate testimony. And we're trying to educate senators and regulators on this loophole that, frankly, no one was aware of. So it's not, oh, this was intentional. It's not. It was a bug. No one thinks that they, we should be having paper filings in the year 2022. And no one thinks that we shouldn't be having foreign corporate insiders have lower disclosure standards. So it's just a matter of time, hopefully just a matter of time before the U.S. Senate and Congress or the SEC actually does something. Thank you, Dan, for doing that. I mean, that's a, a service to not just industry, but really to, to, to the U.S., to, to, to humanity, the, the investors of the world. Um, you mentioned on average when people see the trades. I mean, obviously, no one's going to see the trade unless you physically go into the SEC and look at this paper, which is completely ridiculous. Uh, journalists aren't even going to look and, and let alone average people. So so I appreciate that as, as an investor myself and someone who's gotten burned in some Chinese equities myself, maybe I should, uh, maybe I would have benefited by some, some, some better disclosure there. Uh, final question, yep. speaking of, of, of Dan Taylor going to Washington, um, pretend the SEC staff writ large uh, takes a sleeping pill, goes into a coma, whatever, leaves a note saying, Dan Taylor, you are in charge, at least for now, of the SEC. Uh, if that's the case, what's your agenda look like? Well, the first thing I do is I tell, I call up my friends at the Federal Reserve and I say, you know, you're printing a lot of money these days. <laughs> the SEC can do so. And so I would expand the SEC budget 10x. And with that money, I would do two things. First, I would hire some of the, I would get rid of the government pay scale because everyone at the SEC is on the government pay scale or thereabouts on the government pay scale. And I would pay them competitive wages. That would allow me to hire some of the best and brightest data scientists and analytics wizards to come to the SEC to design algorithms of the sort that I run to throw red flags so that we could actually use those algorithms and analytics to be proactively hunting for accounting fraud and insider trading before it gets reported in the press. So yes, the SEC does investigate accounting frauds. But the rub on the SEC is they typically conduct the autopsy after the person's already been shot, as opposed to preventing it from happening in the first place. So armed with, you know, the world's best data scientists and the world's best data and algorithms, we would go proactive in terms of enforcement, in terms of preventing and detecting. The other thing I would do with that money is really staff up enforcement. Enforcement is completely outgunned at the, at the SEC. Average enforcement lawyer at the SEC is probably going to get one hundred to two hundred thousand uh, dollars in salary. You can look that up. That's on uh, on the website for what uh, government pay scale is for the SEC. Our white collar defense firms are going to be billing two thousand or more by the hour. Those white collar defense firms will often employ former SEC commissioners, former SEC enforcement division uh, personnel. One of the strategies that they will try and do is to run out the clock because they know that they have more resources and more money because their clients can afford it because their clients are very wealthy than the SEC. And so what we need to do is we need to bring parity to this. We need to give the SEC resources so that they can hire the best and brightest, not just best and brightest lawyers, best and brightest data scientists, so that they can go toe to toe with some of the best white collar uh, defense firms. Because unfortunately, the, their dirty secret is, is there's a revolving door between some of the top officials in the SEC and, you know, white collar uh, law firms. And let me tell you, when they leave the SEC, their salary is going up 5x or more when they go to those white collar firms. And, you know, 
they're going to have level of credibility when they go before a judge. And so the SEC needs to be able to have that credibility, needs to be able to have the analytical horsepower, needs to be able to have the lawyer horsepower to go toe to toe. The other thing I would do somewhat controversially, it's an idea that John Coffey um, promoted um, in one of his books, Crisis of Under Enforcement. And he said that we should outsource prosecution for white collar mm -hmm. crimes. So basically open it up so that if a private citizen or plaintiff's attorney wants to sue on behalf of the government for violation of securities laws, that individual can collect a bounty that's a portion of the recovery. So it's very similar to the whistleblowing program in the U.S., where you can get 10 to 30 percent of any SEC settlement or penalty uh, if you provide a tip. I would go further and say you could get 10 percent, 10 to 30 percent of damages should you successfully bring a case um, for violation. I like that libertarian leaning. Yeah. That is the libertarian way. So I do think the sad part is, is that we have much better private sector enforcement of our securities laws than we do public enforcement. The leading detectors of accounting fraud and insider trading are often short sellers and journalists because they get paid directly as a result of what they're finding. They're, short sellers have large incentives to detect fraud because they make money based on the scope of the fraud. That creates some level of distortion. You know, maybe they do short and distort. Maybe they're very highly accurate. But if you don't like short sellers, then you need to give more money to the SEC. Because the worse the SEC is detecting fraud, the greater the profitability and the greater the role for short sellers in the U.S. economy for detecting fraud and hunting. And ironically, the SEC is going after short sellers more these days anyway. Yeah, I think that's probably a strategic mistake. Um, but I can certainly understand, you know, after the meme stock and the AMC and, and GameStop, everybody wants to blame these evil short sellers. Yeah, political theater. Let me tell you, and I, just, I want to state this unambiguously for the record. The U.S. market and accounting fraud, especially with respect to accounting fraud, is much better off and much safer with short sellers in the market than if they left the market. Because it is not the SEC who is the first to detect accounting frauds. It's short sellers, journalists, and often whistleblowers. Absolutely. Absolutely. Uh, Dan, Dan, thank you very much for, for being here. Thank you very much for doing this work. It is, I really mean it. It is a contribution to, to society, to an economy, to humanity. To have people, thank you. Happy to be here. People like you doing this. And certainly thank you to everybody watching at home. I hope you found this interesting and I will see you next time. Thanks a lot, James. Appreciate it.